as some of you might know, uh, who've been before, I do a little quick talk at the start. And so how we listen live, the knowledge to move your music forward. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's great to have you all here, especially people who have never been before. So the agenda is always the same every month. I think this is number 15, by the way. Um, so first I talk a bit about Bita, so people know who I am and what Bita is and why we do this, give you a bit of background. Then we talk about how we listen, um, which is a very important part of our work at Bita. Then we do some announcements. We tell people about stuff that's happening coming up. Um, so you can be aware of what we're doing and what you might want to come to next. And then the second part is our conversation with Miller, Miller Williams from Cobalt. So I'm Mark Brown. I'm the founder and CEO of Vita. This accent is Canadian, not American, but I lived in uh, London, England for 18 years. And now I live in Stockholm, Sweden. And as I tell everyone, I repeat it every time. It's good to learn when you're watching people speak, and you're listening to them to get a vibe on what their background is, because depending on where people have worked and the jobs they've had in the music ecosystem, it gives them a unique perspective on the rest of the way things work. So I started a small independent label uh, in the 90s, back pre-internet, or the internet existed, but it wasn't, uh, wasn't very popular. So pre-internet days, pre-digital days, worked in a physical world, you had to get records and record shops. Then I moved to the UK, end of the 90s, and I worked at probably the premier indie label of the time, if not ever, Creation Records in the A&R department. Then I left there and I worked at a label called Pop Tones, which, which was started by the guy who ran Creation. Uh, and that's why I started doing radio promotion, among other things. Then I left there, and I did radio and TV promotion at my own boutique company for 10, 15 years. So I basically have a pretty big promotion background. Um, then right around the time that I was uh, leaving the UK to move to Sweden, I started Bita. And so that's sort of my story. And what is Bita? Bita is the platform that enables sending and receiving of digital audio in a clean, simple, and secure way, built for everyone working with music today. So what does that mean? Fast and secure audio sharing. Everybody has to move audio around. You're doing it daily, sending, receiving. Everybody does it. And that's what we help you do easily. So how are we different? Beta takes advantage of audio files, unique properties. There's three unique properties. Metadata, we read and write all that information in the file, including lab files. So when you upload something to Beta, we pull all the metadata out, we post it on the screen for you to edit, and then the files are updated. So when you send something to someone, you know that those files are embedded, embedded with the right information. File format and audio quality. So when you upload a WAV file, you can share it in different file formats, lossless, lossy. And that makes it easy instead of throwing all your different file formats in Dropbox, we make it easy to share in different audio formats. And then streamability. We have fast yet secure streaming, meaning you can't rip our links and we're one of the only platforms or well, we're the only platform maybe that prevents, actively prevents stream ripping. So good to know. One thing I always like to mention is we released uh, the first ever white paper, research paper on the state of music sharing uh, late last year. I think, yeah, I think it came out in December and then we talked about it in January of this year a bit. Uh, if anybody wants a copy, they should download it. No matter how you send and receive an audio, it's worth reading uh, to learn about what's best for the people you're sending to, because that's the name of the game. So our mission statement as a company is to provide artists and their teams with the tools and the knowledge to move their careers forward. So what does that mean? Well, Beat is a tool. That's pretty simple. You use Beat to send and receive digital audio. Okay, got it. But then how we listen is what we call the knowledge part of that mission statement. And what is how we listen? Well, it was an interview series we started maybe, we should probably be numbering these things, but it was sometime, maybe two and a half, three years ago. And it's a list of 10 standard questions. Jamie, maybe you'll throw a link in the chat 
so people can read them. And we started as a way for, you, you know, just to learn about how people find and listen and experience new music, be that new, new music or new to them music. And it started just as this blog series, as I said. But, you know, the reason behind it was this idea that we were pretty frustrated by the fact that if you read articles, it's still the same. If you read articles on the internet, like about Spotify or Apple Music or this, that, or the other thing, basically what they say is, oh, you know, all you need to do is get picked up by an algorithm and everything's great. There's nothing else you need to do. Or you get on a playlist and uh, that's it. You just sit back and watch the money roll in or the, you know, the success quote unquote happen. And this is what we're going to talk about with Miller, but this idea that that's just definitely not the case. <laughs> like there's a lot more going on behind the scenes. So these, how we listen is about countering that. It's giving people real information about what they need to do to be successful. And so what we like to do every month is highlight a couple of these, uh, these articles. And Again, this is a common thing that comes up. Uh, Jonathan from Arts and Crafts in, the, in Canada. The main frustration is the inadequate compensation for most artists and rights owners via streaming platforms. Despite the everything on demand e intimacy of streaming, the algorithm is not smart enough to reliably understand my tastes. I resist compart compartmentalization. So I think this is a bit tongue in cheek. Um, but at the same time, it is a big problem. People aren't making the money they used to, and it's hard to make a living as a musician. So it's important. This comes up as a theme in a lot of how we listen. Then we also have another series we started uh, probably late last year called Method to My Music. And it's more focused on people who, uh, who are actually creating music, whereas how we listen is a lot of people who work in and around the music ecosystem. And I loved it, this one when I was reading it today. We think pre-release security is very important. Not that anybody out there is trying to leak our music that we know of, but of course, no parent wants a stranger to reveal their baby to the world. And let's face it, this is 100% correct. Much better, be more beautifully written than I would be able to say it, I'd say. Because it's not about your music leaking and you missing opportunities to make money. It's really about your plan and controlling the narrative is the only thing you have as an artist these days. And that's why you wanna make sure that you roll things out the way you wanna roll it out, not being driven by some sort of leak or somebody getting information they shouldn't have and driving the narrative themselves. So this is super great quote. Then the third series we started uh, earlier this year, maybe four or five months ago, is called Digital Dialogue. And so again, this is a, a, a guest series where we pick someone or someone comes to us with something they wanna talk about in a bit more detail in sort of the digital realm. And this one is from Jessica Powell or Audio Shake, who they use uh, AI to, break your stems into parts, which is perfect for the, this to talk about this with the sync thing. Um, and she talks about this in her article. And I've, I've met Jessica a couple of times and she's a super smart woman, used to work at Google. She's the founder and CEO of AudioShake. So Jamie will throw that in the chat. I recommend reading it and I recommend checking out AudioShake. And here we got a quote that I'll just I'm gonna move my window. We are also moving into a world where music will be all around us, not just in the ways we know today, for example, sitting in a car or bedroom listening to a track, but also via new formats and experiences that are beginning to emerge. Many of those new formats will be based on being able to pull apart, remix and rearrange how, where and when a song is heard. And I completely agree with Jessica. We've talked about this uh, you know, privately before, and this also, ties in with what we're discussing today, the idea that maybe the way sync was 20 years ago is not the way it is now. And I think everybody needs to be thinking what they're doing now, but also understanding where things are going in the future. So how we listen live, what is that and why are we doing it? Well, how we listen live is just an extension of the uh, interview series we did. And we thought what'd be really cool 
is if we can interview some people, because the printed word is limited in some ways, it's much more interesting and engaging to get people together like we do in this case and have someone talk about a subject that they know a lot better than we do. And so that's basically why we're doing it. We wanted to, you know, it's fun to get people together. It's fun to talk about important stuff and exchange ideas. I love getting all these people from all over the world together at one time. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming. Just a heads up, we always donate a little money to Maytree, which is a, a respite for people who are feeling suicidal in London, UK. This is a, issue is super important to us. It's super important to everyone else. Uh, so take a screenshot, check it out, give them a little money, or if there's some, somebody or someone in your area, you know, feel free to donate. It's important to uh, highlight this issue. And then, as usual, this is my, my site. This is the way you can contact me. Um, hit me up on LinkedIn. Jamie, can you throw my LinkedIn in the chat? Um, contact me about anything you want. Uh, I'll throw my details in at the end if I remember. Uh, I usually talk about where I write blog posts here, but I haven't written one in a year and a half. But I've been told they're still relevant. <laughs> Someone was reading them recently. So, uh, yeah, anyway, we move on. Couple uh, just announcement stuff that's good for people to know. We've got a Facebook group. Jamie will throw the link in the chat. We announce stuff in there. If that's the place you like to get your info, just join. We post all the invites in there so you don't miss things moving forward. YouTube, the reason I highlight this is uh, thanks to Colin and Jamie, we've built a pretty good routine where you sign up for an event and then you know, a week after, even if you don't make the event, you get a link to the audio via video. Then it goes up on YouTube and then it goes out as a podcast on all your flaming, your favorite streaming platforms. So Spotify, Apple Music, all of them. So no matter where you're at, what you're doing, you can get access to these, uh, these events. If you've missed previous ones, just go search on any of those platforms and find us or watch on YouTube if you want to see my hats or my glasses or the status of my beard. But they're all there. I actually listen to a lot of podcasts on uh, YouTube as a side note. Next event, how we listen live. We always announce the next one at the, at the, the current one. So Kevin from CD Baby, they just had this massive artist-focused event a couple of weeks ago, I believe, or maybe last week. So building your streaming audience. Tuesday, September 27th. Also, if you all are interested in this, you should come because we're going to announce some other stuff that we're doing. Uh, we've got lots of interesting collaborations coming up. So please, you can sign up now. Maybe Janie, I think we'll even throw a link in the chat now. Oh my God, I've been talking for ages. Sorry. Any questions, hit me up. There you go. Now let's get on with things. Uh, Miller, are you there? Are you on mute? Let me take myself off mute. Yes. I <laughs> yeah. Hey, how's it going? Sorry, I was babbling for ages. I didn't think I... Oh, God, too many announcements. Mm. So before we start, so just tell everybody where you are, exact, like your position even in the building. <laughs> uh, I am at the uh, Cobalt London office. Uh, we have these little kind of telephone booth things that we use for you know if you need to make a personal phone call or a private phone call so i'm it's fairly soundproof so i don't have to uh worry about being interrupted because we do have more of an open plan type of office which oh, is yeah. great there's lots of music going on people chatting and everything which is wonderful but not so good when you're trying to do a zoom chat so <laughs> so that's where i am is, is yeah, it is I'm, it is it a boring designed uh box or does no. it look or is it like a comedy uh london red phone booth no, and neither, neither kind of in between, uh, you know, it's, it's functional, but not super fancy, but yeah, it's, it's comfortable, All nice, right. nice, nice uh, bench seat, nice and padded. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it should be fine. Cool. Great. So what, let's do this. Why don't, tell us what you do now. What is it like, what is your job at the moment? K kind of quite varied. I mean, my title is, uh, Senior VP of Creative, which encompasses the frontline A&R function of signing new writers and artists to Cobalt Publishing. 
Uh, I'm also across, we have a number of smaller publishing companies that we provide administration and some creative services for. So uh, I'm across all the UK, um, we call them pub, pub codes, publishing company partners. So there's Spirit Be Unique, there's uh, San Remo, there's Good Soldier, uh, quite a few that I keep in touch with and just make sure that, you know, if they need our help or what's going on with their with their rosters and um, so there's that. I also do quite a lot on the international side. So we pitch, pitch a lot of songs into the K-pop world, the J-pop world. I work with our Hong Kong office, uh, our sub-publishers in Eastern Europe at Schubert Music. Uh, I'm also on Zoom calls on a weekly basis with our Swedish office or our German office or our French office. Um, and I, we also are getting, our, getting stuck into the world of Afrobeat. So we work with Mr. Easy and his company Empower Africa and recent well not recently but last year signed a, a Ghanaian artist called King Promise who signed to Sony Records here in the UK. Uh, we also work with Niniola. Uh, our New York office signed Omale uh, earlier this year so we're getting connected into the world of you know African artists and uh, Afrobeat world. Uh, but yeah it's um, you know, before the Zoom call, I was helping one of our, our younger A&R guy, uh, Zach, with um, some registration problems that we were having with one of our writers that, you know, the registrations didn't quite match up. So I was kind of going through that on the PRS database to show how that works. Uh, uh, so kind of across lots of different things uh, from the, you know, even though I'm not the sync person, you know, I, I deal with the sync team uh, with requests they might have for we need a song for the Fox TV coverage of the World Cup starting in December or end of November. You know, here's a list of the countries that are participating. Do we have any artists or songs from those countries? But the, but the reason I'm the reason I'm laughing is is that every time we talk, you're always talking about having to do paperwork because something's wrong. This is two times now. Yeah, there's so, always there's always some <laughs> there's there is always some issue that needs to be or some deal parameter that needs to be well that's another thing i was involved with today a couple of deal renewals uh, as well as finding new things obviously we have existing agreements that you know we want to extend or renew so there's you know the negotiations around that um as well so there's it's quite by day is never the same no two days are the same it's always something which is great so but yeah there's always um you know it never runs completely smoothly but that's yeah. the way yeah. the music industry is so like, okay, so let's figure out how, how like, how did you, how, this is a, a broad question, but mm -hmm. let's rewind to, I think, it, did you say your first job was 86, 1986? 86 or 87, something, somewhere back, okay. or back in time, so, yeah. So, so, so let's go, how, how did you, where, what did you, how did you start? And then how did you get sort of like doing the arc that you uh, ended up where you are now? Yeah, well, it's a long I'll, I'll do the seven inch version but um, okay perfect yeah it, so I, I had always played music I'd been in bar bands I'd been in college like the symphonic you know different bands in college uh, and kind of music was a hobby um, and I, a friend of mine said oh you know if you want to get to me music full-time Belmont College in Nashville runs a music you know business music business course or production course so I went and went I just moved to Nashville, got my job, got a job working in a, well, in a hotel, and then did a semester at Belmont. And then uh, on the Belmont uh, intern board, they had intern jobs going. And one was, you know, working in uh, a tape copy room in the days before MB3 files. Uh, so I wound up uh, working for free uh, in the mornings, three or four days a week at this uh, big independent publishing company making cassette copies to give to their song pluggers to take around town to get songs recorded by Dolly Parton or whoever else there was at the time. So, you know, like anything, you meet people, you start networking, and that kind of led to a, a, a paid job at a smaller independent publishing company, uh, which wound up uh, administering a British company called All Boys Music, which was stocking in Waterman, been right before they had Rick Astley and Bananarama and all the hits they came out with in the 80s. Uh, so, and to cut a long story short, eventually I moved over to London, worked for uh, their record label, PWL Records, on the kind of production side. And, um, and then that ended, and I wound up working at um, 
the old BMG records, doing international marketing and promotion. That ended, then I wound up going back into publishing at Sony ATV Music Publishing. I did that for a year, got about six years, got another job offer to start an independent publishing company called Global Talent Publishing. And then did that for about 10 years. And then, um, then I moved to Cobalt uh, UK. So um, yeah, it's been quite a kind of everything from, you know, publishing to label to marketing to back to publishing and you know most of my career has been spent in music publishing though but it's been you know it's been good to kind of see other sides of the music industry well what, what i think is interesting is i always thought like when i started in the mid 90s that there were no schools to learn music so mm -hmm. i think it's super interesting that you said that you went to school even back then yeah but that was just for production right well they the belmont do offer of well they did i get they still do offer a full like a BIM or ACM, you know, they offer, or the Brit school, they, they do have that kind of thing, even back then. Uh, oh, really? I thought I, wow. I, I thought I wanted to, I thought I wanted to work in a studio and be a producer, but I, you know, I soon learned that I just don't have the patience to listen to like a kick drum for an hour to fine tune, you know, a kick drum in a studio, but it was a good experience. I mean, you know, I learned some studio skills while I was there, but, uh, but I think, I think kind of, I was a little bit older and I just thought I don't need to have another college degree to get in the music industry. So, I, I just kind of by luck wound up in publishing, which I think, you know, is for me is the thing that I like doing the best and working with songwriters and, you know. It, cause I, and I like, I, cause I started the same way. Like I dropped out of university to volunteer for free or whatever, which I've learned now is just a complete no, no. <laughs> like anybody who's getting you to work for free people say no to now which i think is a good it's a good thing mm. but back you know back in the day it was like that was the way yeah i did it for a year probably yeah same here i i, I was at least a year doing intern three jobs and then finally started getting paid so um yeah. but you know that that was how you did it back then that's that yeah. was the way in yeah but it's good that there's schools now like i'm you know i've spoken at bim and uh, you know there's a there's a handful of them and, they, and that like people it, it's it's a good way to learn because at the back in the day it wasn't as easy like you swear, no i mean i'm gonna get this info yeah i mean i learned everything i know about publishing just by doing and working with people who fortunately were a lot really good at it and more experienced and you know managed to and when i left sony and started global publishing i didn't really have a lot of background in admin and royalty statementing and all that so i kind of had to learn by doing but luckily i had a few friends who are very good at it who helped me along and yeah um, you know i just learned you know learned that skill but uh, but yeah it's good that there are colleges and music schools berkeley music school and different things that you know you can kind of streamline yourself into whether you want to be a performing musician or a songwriter or you want to be more on the business side or the admin side um to kind of learn about you know, just to general how the music industry works and what, you know, what opportunities there might be for you when you get out of college. So I just want to say I'm seeing some good questions in the chat. So I'm okay. uh, Consuelo, yeah. I, I'm going to, I will get to those in a second. I just want to let them know that I'm, we're going to get on it. But so when did you start at Global? Was that in the mid 90s? No, I started Global in 2001, I think. So, okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, I mean, the guy who started Global Records and Publishing, uh, I mean, I started Global Publishing from scratch, but the guy behind it is the fellow who owns uh, the Global Radio Group now. So this so XFM the, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so yeah. Capital Radio, XFM, Cap. Uh, and this is in Art. London for everybody who's not. Yeah, familiar. so it's a big radio. It's the UK's biggest commercial radio group, uh, but that came much later in the, in the yeah. you know, in the, in towards like 2010 i think or 12 something like that because because when, when, when we chatted last week what i what i thought what, what was super interesting like and this is the advantage of the fact that you've been at it for quite a few years is the fact that the way publishing it, it what was back then in sinks and all this stuff is mm -hmm. not like it is now mm -hmm. And I, 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 I wondered if we could talk about that because yeah. I, I think some people on this call aren't really going to realize what it was like. And, and, and if I remember correctly, like when I moved to London in say 98, like doing sinks was a no-no. Like the people I believe thought they were 
devaluing their music. Is that true? How do you remember the landscape sort of mid mid to late 90s? I mean, my experience when I was at, would have been at Sony ATV at the time, and there was no sync person. I mean, there was a lady called Jenny Parks who was head of admin and copyright royalties in our office. And, you know, anybody who wanted to license a song for a TV ad or a film or whatever, um, she'd deal with it. They, they didn't have a, there was no sync team. And then I kind of fell into it by accident by sending some music around to a film called Shopping. Uh, it was like they wanted, it was a low budget film. And fortunately they wanted electronic music. There's, I, I don't even know why I asked this, but I had the good sense to go, who do you have your soundtrack album with? Oh, we have it London Records. I was like, oh, just so happens Orbital have got a new album out, gave them a CD of the album. And they licensed a couple of tracks. I thought, wow, this is easy. And little did I realize that it, it's not actually very easy. It's actually very <laughs> difficult. So my first ever sync was not, not, it was kind of the outlier rather than the, how it usually works. But yeah, a lot of people wouldn't, you know, um, the Australian, the Olympics in Sydney, I pitched um, the Manic Street Preachers had a song called Australia off their album. And they had done a, a, like an orchestral ver version of it. And I pitched it to the BBC who wanted to use it for their BBC coverage of the Sydney Olympics and the band turned it down. I was like, really? <laughs> you didn't turn down like- you And what was the money like on that? Well, it was, was it, well, it was more profile. It was more profile because here in Europe and certainly in the UK, they're all the BBC, ITV, all the main broadcasters have what's called a blanket broadcast agreement with oh, ERS, yes. which is our performing rights society. So unlike America, where you have to actually license every piece of music that's used on a TV program here, it's just, it, it falls under the blanket broadcast license agreement where the broadcasters pay PRS a fee every year to use whatever music they want to on uh, UK TV broadcasts. And eventually the performance income from those broadcasts winds its way back to the relevant publisher and writers. So we don't actually, you know, Love Island and all these things we have music on here in the UK, we don't actually have to do a, an individual sync license for everyone. But I mean, it's just an example, but yeah, it was a lot of bands just didn't want their music used on Particularly, and, what, and not films, not so bad, but brands and TV ads. No, I don't want my song associated with the toothpaste commercial because that that's just uncool and it's not great and it devalues my music and for you know ten other reasons. So, and, but and the money was extremely good though. Is that not money, correct? Yeah, the money was a lot better than it is now because we didn't have as many. Um, there wasn't you know streaming didn't exist and YouTube didn't exist and so. Um, so really the, the main source of sync income for the UK in, in terms of when it was then, uh, maybe not so much now, was UK TV ads. And um, yeah, some, you know, just didn't, just, it, it, it was almost like the bigger the artist who could get the more money, the more likely they were to say, no, thank you. <laughs> it, was this, it was the smaller artists who were always happy to, more likely to do a, a sync. It's so, it's so hard to believe not. when you, because I, I remember it. But it's just, it's mind blowing considering the way it is now. Mm -hmm. So like, and were we talking also about, like there were no, what was the video game stuff we were talking about? You were well, saying that- Yeah, originally, um, obviously with Sony Computer Entertainment with, with PlayStation started out. So I remember licensing music for like Wipeout and Gran Turismo and a couple other games. But originally we were, able to do uh royalty deals where we got a small like two pence sort of royalty for the music on every game that they sold and that lasted a few years and then the computer games companies decided that they'd rather just pay a flat sync fee yeah. my argument always was well originally was well if your game flops then you don't spend any money on music and you know that's just our bad luck but if the game's super successful and obviously the writers should be compensated fairly but that didn't last very long and they went, you know, to what it is now, which is a synchronization model for music and games. It's just a flat fee. There's no going, going royalties or anything. So, yeah. Um, so like, how did, how did we get from that to where we are now? It, was it moving in that direct, like, how did people get over this idea that they didn't like, that, that it was uncool? Because it can't be that streaming showed up and everybody thought, 
oh, I'm going to take the toothpaste ad. Did, did attitudes change or think, did it, did the creative element get better? Like, did they make better ads or what do you think it is? I, I, I sound mercenary about it, but I think at the dawn of the MP3 age and streaming and down MP3 downloads, obviously, you know, there was a lot of money floating around when people were still buying CDs. When people stopped buying CDs, all that dried up. And I think it was more a case of, well, hang on a minute. You know, we need to, you know, if you're a manager, <laughs> particularly, you know, your 20% margin goes down if, you, if you're receiving less income from the record company through, you know, record sales. <clears throat> so I think it was, I think, I think partly it was just how things moved along and, you know, People are like, well, we can't, you know, we have, how else can we make some income? Okay, well, we might, probably will have to start licensing music for, for TV ads. And it's not going to be the end of the world if we're on a computer game or we get a song used on a, a TV show, that kind of thing. Like I said, I, I never found films to be too problematic. It was always more that the, when you were trying to associate a brand with a song, that's when the whole thing kind of became problematic with a lot of, as I say, mainly the bigger the artist, the more they would be the more picky they would be or not be interested at all in licensing for a TV ad. So uh, I think it was um, a financial consideration that kind of drove that um, as, as, you know, CD sales kind of went plummeted um, as we came into the download age. So, um, and I think it's just also a younger generation who grew up with, you know, with TV and TV ads and, they don't see such a big problem with that uh, as maybe an older generation would have done that, you yeah. know, um, you know, devaluation of our brand as a band or as an artist. So, yeah. But there were a couple of things I remember back then. It was, there was one band who had done a sync with one of the major papers and they got slated, like they got absolutely slated for mm -hmm. it. And it was just, it, it killed them. It killed the band, I think. But like th now the other side of that, what was, to give everybody an idea of like sort of the, the publishing world, like, cause it's pretty complicated. There's publishers, sub publishers, there's mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Like, what was it like back then again, sort of in, in, in the Sony days. And then as you s started setting up an independent publisher, like what was the sort of the, were there, were there only the major labels? Was it, because at least now, there's loads of different companies you can look to. Back then, there weren't as many record companies to sign to. Was it the same in publishing? What was the environment like? Um, I mean, uh, the I think there's always been, you know, a, a fairly healthy environment in publishing. When in terms of you know major publishing companies and independent publishing companies, and there's always been independent publishing companies being purchased by bigger publishing companies and you know so it's it's it that has never really changed through through the years uh, um i think hopefully you know the the royalty process is better for writers overall because you know we have more technology now you know back in the day when i started it was you know your contracts were kept in a folder in a, in a file cabinet you know i mean here at cobalt they're on a file cabinet so everything's computerized um so um you know and it's it's easier you know the communication's better it's easier to register songs electronically so there's less problems with bad registrations with the money going to the wrong people um you know it's not great but it's better than it was and it's just because i think you know that is probably a benefit of of technology um, how much better do you think it is do you think it is like because a lot of people say it's terrible still in your experience, do you think well, things are, as far as if I'm an artist, am I getting paid most of my money now, do you think, or? I guess it depends who your publisher is and how, what the, how right. the statement, I mean, everything used to be on paper back in the day and you'd have to look yeah. through, you know, you literally have to look line by line to see, well, hang on a minute, you know, I have song X on album Y and I've been paid this amount and I've got another song on the same album with the same, I wrote the same share and I'm getting paid less. Why is that? So then you'd have to go back and 
go through to find somebody at the society and chat, you know, find out, well, hang on, why it should be the same amount for the same period of time. It's the same share. It's, just, it's the same album, the same artist, all that sort of thing. And now it's, you know, now you can use, you know, technology to kind of find those problems a lot quicker because now there's, you know, you know, any one song, if it's a big hit, can have millions of individual lines of revenue uh, from all sorts of places, from streaming services, from apps, from you name it. So it's it'd be impossible for humans to do paper statements anymore. I mean, we, you know, I mean, some people with COBOL still like them, but it's like, well, we'll send you the electronic statement if you want to print it out. You by all means <laughs> knock yourself out, but you know, we're not going to chop down a forest of trees to issue paper statements anymore. It's just it's not it's not feasible. Yeah. So. Um, so, so there was less I, I, to collect, I, I would, it, there was less. It was less complicated because literally you had mechanical royalties from the sale of a physical product. A, okay, a yeah, one. Yeah. And you had performance income, mainly from Two. radio play or TV maybe, or maybe from a TV ad and synchronization. That was kind of it now. So three, th so three revenue streams basically. Yeah, right? and that was kind of it. Now you've got those three revenue streams plus you've got streaming. Yeah. Four. Four. Then you've got apps. So there's apps and Apple, Apple, beat Apple, uh, fit, Apple Fitness, all of that. Apps. Okay. You've got now you've got NFTs. NFTs. Another yeah. one. But, uh, but it, are, is anybody getting royalties out of, off of NFTs yet? Do you think? Yeah, we've done, we've just launched one with uh, an artist called Don Richard and uh, an, a, a Ghanaian uh, visual artist whose name, sorry, escapes me, but it's kind of one of the first ones that a publisher has done. Usually wow. record companies will be the, the driver behind NFTs. And we do actually do licenses that cover the righteous royalties from an NFT. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. It's so, not, we got it's, yeah, so you got that. Um, yeah, there's Pandora. That, I mean, it's, there's all sorts yeah. of different things now that didn't. Yeah, so at least double the amount of streams. And then I'm assuming those first three, there'd be a couple line items, right? And then those yeah. other newer ones would be thousands. So would be thousands and thousands of little half a penny. Yeah, it depends time right? to get some money. So, and also the other thing, the good, the other upside of streaming is that, um, you know, it's worldwide now, whereas before, you know, this is more the record company thing, but you know, the the the, the general can the general way it worked is that well, if I signed an artist in the UK, I had to make them, I had to break them in the UK before any of my other uh, subsidiary companies in other territories would spend money to market that artist in France or in America or in you know, the Manic Street. Go back to Manic Street Preachers. They were massively successful in the UK, but they could never get the US label to no, do know. anything with yeah. them in America. And it's like, well, you know, you'd think they'd give it a, off the back of the success they had. You'd think they would give them a shot, but it just did just never happen. So um, now it's a little bit more democratic because people, you know, once it goes up on Spotify or Deezer or Believe or wherever, um, Apple, um, then you know, you've got Ngami in the Middle East to, you know, increase their revenue, increase their uh, subscriptions by over 20 something percent year on year. It's like, quite, you know, I mean, it's still relatively small, but it's growing. So, you know. And, the, and so back the, 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 pie, the pie is getting bigger, but the shares are getting smaller. That's probably yeah. the best way I can describe it. Okay. And and then so like back then you'd sign to a publisher and then they'd have sub publishers everywhere else who would collect the money in all the different territories. And then it'd be like the telephone game where stuff would get lost along the way. Like is that could, yeah, I mean, well, it's Sony. Obviously, Sony had its own offices around the world, as I yeah. vaguely remember. So everything went through the Sony system where they would collect. Um, you know, royalties from different parts of the world and eventually you'd get back to the, the writer. Um, the other way you do it is you have, as I've done as well, you have uh, independent companies in every territory or maybe yeah. those territories that will collect. So for example, you could have Clippers in Spain, you could have Cafe Concerto in Italy, you could have, uh, what were they called? Um, Something like Cloud Nine for the Netherlands or Benelux. Um, you could have Buddha Music for Germany. And they all these companies 
still exist and do a great job. But I think um, it's increasingly more difficult for them. So the trade-off is, well, I, I, if I go with a major publisher, maybe my collections might be a little bit better because it's one thing that does everything world, you know, from around the world. Um, so I've got less paperwork, but if I go at the indie route, then I've got more paperwork, but I might get more attention because they have smaller catalogs. So, my, so yeah. that's kind of the trade-off uh, that, you know, you'd have to weigh up whether, whether it made sense to do it, take on the extra paperwork and the admin on the basis that you might actually have more songs, more revenue, or more songs placed, more creative help in an individual territory. So, um, and now, like, if you go to, like, you know, a, like a bigger publisher, are they doing all the collection for themselves worldwide usually? So, is it much more centralized now because of technology? I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I use Cobalt as an example. Yeah. So, we do have a few sub publishers in different places. So, for example, we have a sub publisher for Japan, partly because you know, the Japanese market is dominated by local, local artists, yeah. but even Adele was, was probably the number 20th biggest selling artist in Japan last year. And everything from 19 on up was all Japanese, right? Yeah. So, and, and our catalog is mostly Anglo-American repertoire. So you have to have a physical presence office in Japan to be a direct publisher member of Jazzrack, and it just doesn't make sense for us to do it. So we have a sub-publisher. But by and large, on all the major territories around the world, USA, Canada, Germany, Italy, France, about eight countries in Latin America, Cobalt is a direct member of each of those performing and mechanical rights societies. Okay. So writers send us the song registrations and release information. We register all those songs correctly electronically with all these different societies around the world eventually the money comes back to cobalt and we do all the statementing so the hub of all the admin and royalty statementing is actually here in london although we do have for example um there is uh what's his name um i trying to think of somebody there is um Ricardo in Germany, who speaks German and is a great admin person and deals with GEMA in case we have any queries with GEMA or we yeah. need to chase something up with GEMA or whatever. So we do have, you know, and he deals with a lot of our German songwriter clients. So um, on the ground, we have, you know, a person usually on the ground uh, in each of those territories, uh, not only do the admin, but also creative teams to do the song pitching and the A&R and the sync and all that as well. But you know, the collection part is we do it all centrally. It all comes into the central hub in London eventually. And then we statement from London out to all the different writers. So that, but most major publishers will have a similar kind of setup to what we do, so. Okay, and so, so now, so we sort of set the stage and it's like, we knew the way it used to be, how things have changed. Hmm. And so, so say, say we're, like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a singer songwriter. I perform live mm -hmm. because I saw someone asked about, you know, writers who don't perform and we'll come to that in a second. But so I'm like, I'm an artist and I write my own songs or you and I are in a band or something like before it was like, you try to get signed, you try to get your rep, put your record out. You try to get a 30 grand advance on your publishing and you're doing well, blah, blah, blah. But like what, considering the environments change, like what should, artists and per like performing artists and songwriters be doing should like what are the parameters should they be looking to, to to find a big publisher right away should they be holding out like like if if we're just starting out like what the hell to a certain extent it was easier before because you knew you were either in or you're out now you're in you're neither in nor out like what do you sort of recommend when you meet newer artists and there's trying to weigh up their options? Uh, well, I mean, most major publishers will probably, unless the, they really think the music is amazingly good, will usually see how things develop because artists have the, a way to get their music heard by being on a digital distribution service like AWOL or TuneCore or Believe or, you know, Platoon, depending on whatever, you know, there's loads of them. Um, but I think, if you are an artist and that is your main focus, then 
it's like building a fan base it's it's doing the work uh, you know we talked about this earlier there's a, a young scottish artist called katie gregson mcleod whose song complex was number one on new music friday and she's been doing gigs for about the past four or five years she's from inverness up north she's been releasing songs she's been on um BBC introducing a few times. So she's been putting in the work and growing her audience. I think that's really an important thing to do. I mean, you might get lucky and get something on TikTok. Obviously, there's a lot of artists who will do cover versions and get on TikTok and YouTube and are discovered in that way. But I, I think, you know, there's nothing like, you know, getting out there writing songs and being in front of people and developing, you know, growing an audience yourself and doing a little bit of doing a DIY if you really want to get um, you know a major label or major publishing company really interested in what you're doing and now Katie has got everybody and their granny chasing her for a deal because so you think like she would have she would have like you know she would have just she wouldn't have sold or published like how what do you think she would an artist like that would be doing with the publishing I you mean, think you know, it's horses for courses. If if you feel that you're a great writer and you, you can hold out and you want to get a bigger deal, then you should hold out and release and just kind of crack on. And, you know, if you've got things, if you've got songs coming out, just join PRS as a, or a society as a, as a writer member and just get on with it and see where it leads. You know, otherwise you could sign a publishing deal with a, an independent, like I ran Global Publishing. So I was more inclined to try to sign things early and help yeah. them develop uh, as a more like a boutique publisher because I didn't have a big roster. I didn't have unlimited amounts of money to spend on things. I had to be pretty cautious. And I was, you know, I could take time to take something from zero to hero, um, yeah. you know, without too much of a financial risk if it didn't work out. So it, de it depends what you, you know, it depends kind of what you want. If you want a lot of individual help handholding early on, then an independent smaller publisher is probably a better route to go. But of course, they have to love the music. You know, they have to yeah. go, okay, well, we see your vision and we want to help you. And you, know, you have to think that they can help you become successful. But the deal that you're going to get offered probably won't be as good as if you would get a, a deal later, you know, if you waited and maybe got a deal later yeah. on down the line with a, with a bigger publishing company. So, so you go, so, so that's interesting about the smaller publisher thing. Like, mm. so, so say I, well, our band or the way, you know, my songs, I thought I convinced a smallish publisher, like, do I have any chance of getting any sinks or like, is it, is it about having someone reputable pitch your songs or is it about if I'm a nobody, I'm not going to get a sink or like what, what, you know, cause that's what I think a lot of people want to know is it's like, how do I get sinks? But m maybe you just don't get any early on. Or I mean, I don't, I can't say for artists who have had, who have no publishing, how do they yeah. get sync? I mean, there are sync agents like Zinc is one in America I know of that you can approach that will take you, you know, that will, that will take you, you know, will do or will pitch songs that are unpublished um, where they can clear, usually can clear, they have, a, they can clear 100% of the rights. Like you're a single solo songwriter, you've written a song 100%, you own the master rights, it's all your yeah. thing. Then you, you know, it's, you, there are all sorts of sync agents around that might take it on and pitch it to see if they can secure a sync for you. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, you know, from my experience, I've had syncs on, you know, demo songs to, you know, big releases in, in you know, and, it just kind of, and usually it's because I've developed, oh, I mean, I don't do it anymore, but in the past I used to do more sync work, but it's developing relationships with music supervisors and advertising agency people. And, you know, here at Cobalt, we probably have 60 people worldwide who all they do is pitch music for syncs. And so they have those relationships with music supervisors and trailer yeah. companies and all the rest. So um, that, that, you know, it, it, like everything else in the music industry, it's, it's a relationship type of thing. You know, if you, if you, if somebody who's reputable is repping you, who's got a good track record and knows sync people, then it's probably going to be, it's not guaranteed, but you know, at least they can get in the doors and get the music heard. Yeah. And, and funny enough, we've, we've got, we've got a, uh, someone from a sync agency here. So live. Hello, I'm from a sync agency. Anyone can get a sync, big or small artist. 
well, without social media presence, uh, although sometimes that helps, the main thing is the music has to match the visual and the production has to obviously be on point. Yeah. So, and, and what I'm assuming, I'm going to re read from what Liv says and what you said, that the production doesn't need to be perfect, but it needs to fit what's going, the mood of the song, because you mentioned one of the artists you work with they had just you got a sync with a scrappy demo is that yeah correct? yeah it was yeah. A, it was a couple months probably about 2010 something like that it was a guy called j it was an artist called jj pistolet who went on to form the vaccines but anyway he wrote this song called i think it was called golden age if memory serves me <laughs> and i pitched to, to uh i did contact a music supervisor in america i sent the song to it wound up getting used on a sun chips Ad, which is potato chips crisps that were made with the power of the sun so uh, so um and i just you know i said look do you want to use this is like a scrappy demo you, we can make it sound better you know it's like no no we like it just the way it is it fits the brief and i was like okay great so literally it was a demo that was done in somebody's front living room um and it was i think as memory serves me it was just like a guitar vocal thing that was it so it, yeah, you're right. It has to kind of fit the brief and the mood and the storyboard and all of that. Um, it's, you know, um, it, you know, it, and, and I, it just sometimes you're in the right place at the right time with the song that all sync agents just love and they want to use it. I've had that happen before. So uh, there's no cookbook recipe um, of how it happens, but, you know, sync agents and music supervisors are kind of the door, the, the gatekeepers into that and they will know what they need and what's what's best so and, and like one of the i want to shift to this idea because like because it's easy i think at least in my mind when you think about if you're a band you're releasing albums you're doing all this other kind of stuff so you're not necessarily relying on the publishing world and the sync world that a lot of people find difficult to understand but somebody asked this question i wanted to talk about it anyway what do i do if so let's just say I have stage fright or I've got a terrible voice. I'm never going to play live. Like I don't release my own music because we did have a discussion about it earlier in the week or maybe late last week that, you know, you mentioned loads of really interesting things about how an artist can do like writing songs with other artists and what, how those things pay off because everybody focuses on sync, but you mentioned a lot of things about, you know getting if you get a track on a on a you know k-pop record and that they f still sell loads of cds there so like it say someone c comes through your door and you realize that they write amazing songs like what do you recommend those kind of people do to promote themselves without having those normal or not normal tools but maybe more obvious tools that performing artists have if you are a non-artist songwriter or writer producer, again, it really comes down to a lot about relationships that, that you can form with other songwriters and and maybe a manager. You know, so you know you might find that you know it's it's you meet you know it's meeting people, it's being it's networking, it's it's all of that, and 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 hopefully finding other writers that maybe are at your level or maybe slightly higher um and promoting yourself you know before i used to say to people you know before really we had a telephone and that was kind of it you know to to promote our writers now I, I say to songwriters look you've got you know twitter you've got instagram you've got facebook you've got whatsapp you've got all these different ways to get in touch with people and you know how did omale wind up getting justin bieber to feature on his song well oh, justin bieber found omale on instagram liked the music and then reached out to him directly so it all that is insane isn't it It all really? happened very <laughs> organically that's how like it is happened. insane so it, you know it so i always say to writers you know if you hear stuff online that you'd like or, or spotify or whatever just do a little bit of research and find out who wrote the song and you know just send them a message and just say, hey, I like the song, I'm a writer, here's a link, you know, be, be happy to hook up with you and maybe write a song sometime. It's, you know, most, you might not get an answer, but if you do it enough, you, you run into other people. And it's also about being, I guess, a little bit strategic. That's kind of what we do a little bit of with newer writers. So, okay, well, you know, we can't, you know, 
we probably won't get um, directly in the room with, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an example, directly in the room with uh, Sam Smith. But who are some of the writers that maybe have written songs for Sam Smith that we might be able to get our writer with to either just write something for pitch or maybe we find another emerging artist to bring into the session and just make, start making those connections and networking with other writers to then, um, you know, increase that the, our writers' profile into bigger rooms, into bigger, bigger song other songwriters and other writer producers and artists as well. So, you know, it's it's um, you know it's building blocks really. And but the right, I think the I say to writers, you know, look, you know, we we do a lot of a lot of work putting sessions together for writers and pitching songs and a lot of creative work, which is great. But I also expect the writer to also be an engine with us to you know why is uh, you know why a lot of writers su super successful part a lot of them are really good networkers and they get around they meet people they talk to people they're likable they you know people like them in the session they get re repeat business so um so you mentioned like the session all the time like is that is that do people like how is that like writers camps like i i read i remember i read in a new york times article like three or four years ago about just how these things work that all these people get thrown in a room and they mm -hmm. write songs that, like is, is that something that's been going on for years or yeah. is that a newer thing or like i mean how, like more, how do you get in on that action that sounds more, brilliant there's more of them now i mean you know uh, ultra records is running a camp down in uh, where is it cornwall or somewhere in september so we know people at ultra records and said oh we've run in this camp you know who you know this is who's going to be there who can you recommend so we've recommended you know some of our writers that we think you know could be good for the camp and you know we'll probably get a few of them on that on that camp you know? so um there's you know there's all sorts of camps going off all the time um that we're trying to get writers into um some are big you know some are big lots of people which and some are much, much more compact and there's you know a set crew of writers so it's harder to get into those smaller ones but um you know if we know about them we'll be pitching writers for them and then the other thing we do is <clears throat> if we you know trying to connect our writers with artist sessions generally uh we do you know we do organize them writing for pitch but we preferably like to put our writer in a room with an artist uh, because we have more of a chance to, that that artist might like the song and actually release it rather than we've got a great song, but now we have to pitch it and find a home for it. So uh, Okay, okay. So so the shortest distance between two points is to get a writer in with an artist. Yeah. And then and also- Because it's a personal connection again. Yeah, right? it's a personal connection. And also if the artist doesn't wind up using the song, then we if the song is really good, then we may have a shot of getting it used as a sync for something because, you know, a music supervisor might love Tom Grennan and say, oh, do you have, we're looking, for, you know, do you have any songs that are like Tom Grennan that are unreleased? Oh yeah, we've got this demo that's never been, you know, he's not using, he's not releasing it on his album or as an EP, but he might let it go for a sync. So, it, you know, that that's another angle we can use if we have the artist on the, you know, on the demo. So, uh, so like one thing there, I, I've got a question about, um, Africa specifically, but I do want to talk about what I referenced because I love talking about Japan because I think mm. it is such a closed market and it operates in a way, I know streaming has become more popular there, but mm. it's traditionally a very physical market. But yeah. like, like I, I also want to talk about like, like, cause you said you've been doing a lot of stuff in South Korea and, you know, like, can you, t can you tell everyone that story you were telling me about how the, the way it works is it, it, like, that's a, it's better getting on a small, having a small percentage on John track there because you can get royalties from CDs because they still sell CDs, but then you also have to pay, what's it called? The person, not the translator, but the, the adapter. The, the adapter. Yeah. I, yeah. Can you tell, can you okay. tell everybody your theory right. about it, all, all that it, kind of stuff? It, it, de it depends on who, that's always on yeah. the artist. So if, if I had to, you know, as I say to me, if you have a chance of getting a song recorded by, I don't know, BTS is probably not a, the best example because they're so massive, but say Red Velvet or Esper or uh, this new girl band called Ivy, which we've got a couple of cuts on. 
if you have a chance to get a song recorded on that, and even if you have to give up a share of, say, 10 to maybe 15 percent to the local adapter, because the local adapter will basically, if it's done in Korean, they will rewrite the song. It's not a, so. It's not a translator. It's right? not a translation. It, no, they, I know. They yeah. may keep, they may keep the chorus or some parts in English, but uh, we've just got one that is being recorded by a K-pop band, which was originally called uh, "Scared of the Dark," and it's been retitled as "Queen of Hearts." So. <laughs> So it's, like, it's, it's, crazy. so it's not it's not, it's it's not a straight translation, but but the point <laughs> no, <it's> being, not. <laughs> but the point but the point being is that you know depending on who the the Western artist is, obviously if it's Beyonce or somebody like that, you'd go with Beyonce. But if it's a relatively equal sized you know pop artist, I would say it probably makes more sense to go with the K-pop act because they still they still sell a lot of CDs, so. You know, Ivy's uh, last. Eight, so the mechanic for everybody to understand, sorry, the mechanicals would be higher because a mechanical royalty on a CD is much higher than being a, getting a bit on the stream, right? That's correct. So, okay. I mean, it takes a bit longer for the money to come from Korea, but overall, you, it's you will you will earn more money. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the, I think Ivy's. We had uh, Love Dive, and I think the first day sales for Love Dive in Korea was something like two hundred thousand CDs day wow. one. So huh. that's like a billion many, streams. Not, yeah, there are not many UK bands that could sell two hundred thousand CDs of day one. So that that's kind of my my yeah. my my uh, thought behind it. But yes, Japan is quite insular. They don't export anywhere near as well as the Koreans do. For a variety of reasons, but um, but it's still a very lucrative market if you can get a song placed with a J-pop act. Um, and some writers, um, the Roasting House guys, for example, in Sweden, do really great business. But may, most of everything they do is K or J-pop, or sometimes C-pop. Is that that three-person group? from sweden i think I, I read an article about that yeah, like guy I and two women to, or something yeah i don't really know the roasting house guys that well uh we do admin uh a company called echo music out of sweden and they have cassiopeia and they, they do they do really well in the k-pop space but they're wow. swedish based um because i just think i think it's so like it's something i i think about and talk about a lot like this idea that just because you live where you live doesn't mean it works like that elsewhere and i think these more the, the different stories to tell, I think, make it very positive to understand that there's not one way of doing things mm -hmm. that, you know, that like, again, like a small slice of a bigger pie is just as good or better than lots of streams that pay close to nothing. And that there are those options depending on where you end up. So that someone like, cause I'm sitting here in Stockholm, like, so someone around the corner here can be writing songs for for records that are released in south korea or whatever mm -hmm. and and you, you know like it's just crazy to me so i do have this question about africa so this is from leu l-e-u-l hopefully i got your name right sorry um republishing what models can be adapted in fledgling african music industries say for example ethiopia where proper infrastructure is not in place so Copyright society, and their examples are copyright societies, royalty collection, distribution, internet banking, streaming options. So that's super interesting. Emerging markets for music, they don't have the kind of infrastructure. Like, what do you, like, you've been doing more stuff in Africa. What do you think of all that? Like, how do people get that stuff going? Uh, I mean, I would say probably most of our income for the African artist or writers that we you know, administer or publish would be coming from outside of Africa. Yeah. Um, I think most of the writers who are signed to Empower Africa are either BMI or PRS members. They don't belong to the local society, which is bad for the local society. But if they join a local society, they probably wouldn't see any uh, income for their writer's share of performance. You know, it's it's they're just not because they don't have the contacts to collect it. Is that it's 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 just not i hate to say this but they're just not up to speed yet uh in terms of you know however i think it will change pretty rapidly because in the past you know music was a physical thing now everybody's got a mobile phone so yeah 
as the telcos come in and start, you know, offering subscription models or, you know, you get music bundled with your phone subscription or whatever it might yeah. be, that will start, that will start to change. But I think ultimately the local, the governments in those countries will have to have a look at their local societies and just go, well, hang on a minute there, you know, if we, if we actually sorted this out, you know, then I, this is what's happening in China. They've, you know, they've, they've amended their intellectual copyright laws because I think the Chinese government, well, hang on a minute, you know, if we had a really good, uh, what's it, I uh, can't remember what their society is called, but, you know, we're not collecting enough money from, you know, radio stations need to be licensed, you know, th all that. So it's, it's, it, there is light at the end of the tunnel, but I think it's going to take a minute for Africa to kind of sort of catch up because most of the music that's consumed in Africa is African, you know, from Africa. It's not necessarily Western artists so much. So, um, so I think there's, you know, I think there is a push to kind of go, okay, well, you know, we have so much talent here, but unless that talent can make money, you know, and I think, you know, I don't, uh, you know, certainly us as Cobalt, we don't want to be seen as going in and being a land grab. Oh, we just sign everything and just hope for the best, you know, yeah. um, because, you know, to have a sustainable music industry within Africa, because it's quite a, obviously there's, you know, well, we had someone on from, continent. there's so many different types of cultures we, and music, yeah. you know, it's not, it's not all one thing. And I think people can't forget that it's, you know, what and we were discussing this last month and, it, and it's just, it's ridiculous to even say, oh yeah, like Africa, like it's a, it's a series of countries, like there's, mm -hmm. you know, West Africa, East Africa, South Africa, like it's just ridiculous. Like, and to generalize is nearly impossible, but on that well, front. I mean, but you on, know, universal, universal have an office, I think in Mariah Records, why well, it says Universal Records, uh, Sony Publishing have opened an office in Nigeria now in Lagos, so that's good. So. You know, I, I can't say, I can't, you know, say with the, if you did X, Y, and Z, this would fix the problem. I think it's, it's just going to take time. And, um, and certainly as Afrobeat and African artists become, have success in the wider world, that helps as well. But you re we really want to make sure that they are, they can, you know, that where they're from, there's a sustainable music industry there. It's not just, well, the ones that go off and become successful internationally are the only ones that people care about. So, um, and we've had a question from just on this front from Ian Priceless. So, Ian, are you in Ghana? He's written. Um, how would you describe the progress made by African artists so far since the time you've been involved with some of them on the publishing side of things? So, like, yeah. do you think the last? How long have you been working? more closely with African artists? Probably the last, I'd say last couple of years, so not very long at all. But I think, you know, if you look at, obviously, Wizkid, Burner Boy, we have Mr. Easy. Um, uh, Thames, obviously, has done amazingly well. So, yeah, there's, you know, those artists are making an impact. And I think um, in the wider world, which I think, you know, reflects back really well back to Africa um, and you know we certainly from a collections point of view you know the, our deals are doing really well you know you know we, we're you know we're seeing money from all different parts of the world coming in so it does have an international impact and as more artists collaborate between you know you get Latin artists and Afrobeat artists working together or you know Justin Bieber and Omale, that sorts of Ed Sheeran and uh, Fireboy, you know, all those sorts of things start to happen, and it just it just creates more opportunities for more artists. Um, and yeah. Kayla has written said Amazon Prime just opened an office in Nigeria as well. They mm -hmm. want to produce original content in Africa yeah. after the success of rich and famous African series on yes. Netflix. So then there's there you've got sync opportunities. Yeah. Um, and then, but we've opened a can of worms here because David McConey, I hope I said your name right, is asking, so what is it you guys think? I, I, I don't have an opinion on this. Miller will, but what, what should we do to bridge the gap? Does it mean we should focus more on international partners? Like with aligning with a, international collection agencies? Because that's a catch 22, right? You want the local agencies to do well, but then if you're worried about your career, you only have one chance. Like, you, yeah, you know, you, you what don't do you want think to be, about 
do you want to do you want to be the guinea pig or not that's it that's the question <laughs> yeah. um yeah i mean look this samro is good this is as i think it's a south african society and hopefully you know i know uh david david uh at sheer music it does a lot of you know uh, education across other parts of africa beyond south africa so i'd say it's just going to take time but i think i hate to say it but i think right now you know you if you're trying to have success and you want a decent performing or join a, a good performing rights society i'm not so sure that the current apart from samra i can't speak for the rest so you know don't shoot me down if you, someone goes actually i work for you know one of the other societies and they're really good yeah um but i think you know you may consider having said well unfortunately i'm just going to have to join one of the other pros bmi ascap sasm you know prs whatever um for the time being, I mean, you can always switch back, you know, it's not impossible to leave one and join another one. Um, and I never really realized, it. so you could just join, I could join me in Sweden, I could join one in Canada, I could join so yeah. many fellows. And I why? mean, I've, I've had one writer who had SASM for France, CSAC for North America, and then PRS for the rest of the world, which I'd said, that's probably too complicated. You probably should just join one. Because well, why? What was their logic behind that? I don't think they had any logic behind it, really. <laughs> um, but I just think it was, you know, you just make it like you're just making it like complicated because that means you've got to, as a writer, you have to keep in touch with three different societies to make sure they're doing what they should be doing for you as a as a songwriter. So, plus, us so, as a publisher has to remember, okay, we've got this society collecting for this here, this one here, out there. Like, like th that's crazy. I like, I had no, I had no idea that was the case. But then, like, we also talked last week about what is like something like centric music, where is the, is that that's not uh, like a P a PRS type thing. That's, no, that's a they're, they're okay. uh, I mean, I can't talk. I can't really say a lot of not that because I, I don't really know what their model is now because they've been purchased by a com bigger company called Utopia, but yeah. originally. I would say centric was sort of like a mini cobalt and in, in as much as they did they i mean we pay we do no advance and advanced deals but centric originally was no advance deals super short term you could get out with like with 30 day notice and they would collect your they try you know they register your songs and try to collect your money for you and they also i think provided some sync services so it was a very super super flexible type of publishing arrangement which you know did suit some writers like that and went, went down the centric route but i as i said i'm not really sure what their plans are how they're functioning now because they're part of a bigger bigger company they may be more you know paying advances and all the rest but it's you know i you know there's a few people that work there that used to work for cobalt a really long time ago so okay um, so like but but that's sort of making me think like it is basically the deal at the moment that you can find any solution that you need mm. but that you really as an artist need to figure out what you need so what you want to do yeah what your goals are because you, you know i do talks all the time called the artist journey and i'm always telling people look you need to get all the you're, you're eventually going to get all these people to help you and sync and publishing is part of that mm. but if you don't know who you are and what you want to do <laughs> it's pretty hard to figure out what the next steps are to take, who you want to work with, who you want as a manager. Like, is that the way you see publishing now that if an artist has a vision for what they want to do and maybe a tolerance for risk in the sense that they're willing to delay revenue early on to be in a better position later, does that mean that they can find a deal to suit them in the short term? Yeah, I think I think there's enough, enough, you know, um, there's enough different models that can be used to whether it's a cobalt or a centric or an independent, a smaller independent publisher, or okay, I'm just going to register. I'm a UK based writer. I'm just going to register as a writer member of PRS and everything PRS and MCPS collect comes directly to me for the time being until I, you know, until I feel I need to get a publishing deal in place. I mean, usually, you know, um, you know, most of our writers, even the non-performing song, you know, non-artist songwriters usually have a manager in place 
uh, to help them okay. with their careers. It's not always essential, but it is helpful. I'm not saying people should run out and get a manager straight away, but you know, the, the, yeah. the London grapevine is really small. And if, if people are out working and getting songs or playing gigs, and if it's good, somebody will hear about it quick enough and it gets on the great on the a and r grapevine and then all of a sudden you might find lots of a and r people turning up at your gig it, that's just ah. the way it is the, i mean and there's plenty of opportunities so for so far sounds as to, you know all that you can use to you know find places to play and get get your music heard I, i'm glad that you say that though because when i lived in london it's true like if something started to move everybody would know about it and and it's other people are doing the work for you i guess so i've got another question from latana mm -hmm. um do writers sign assignment details with pros or exclusive licenses this is something that has bothered me for a while so so you, uh, okay no. i'm not the admin expert but generally <laughs> what happens is a songwriter will affiliate with a or join a performing rights society so using prs as an example so i am a writer member of prs i have a publishing deal with cobalt so prs collects all my performance income from wherever it comes from streaming radio play whatever out of that total performance income half of it goes back to the publisher to recoup my advance if i've been paid in advance and half of it comes directly to me as the writer the publisher collects all the other part, which is the mechanical income part of the income, you know, money that revenue that's generated. But you, as a writer member, you can join PRS uh, if you don't have a publisher to, and they would pay you 100% of the performance income. And if you also join MCPS as a writer member, they would pay you all of the mechanical income. So uh, it just, you know, you, ah, okay. you're, not, you're not giving them anything they just have the mandate to collect income for your songs. So they don't okay. own the copyright or anything of your music. Okay. So Latana, so I'm, I'm just, Latana's written to say, I'm referring to the agreement signed with the collection societies like PRS. So mm -hmm. to, to put that in the simplest terms, you're giving the PRS the right to collect the money on mm -hmm. your behalf. Yeah. Latana, does that answer your question? Let's see. We're gonna. We're. Uh, I, I. I'm the middleman here on this. Hopefully they'll come back. So. So. But to explain that again. So P P P R S is performance. Yeah. Then M C P S is mechanical. So like on C D S. If you ever got that great de detail in in, in uh, South Korea, they would be the ones who would collect it. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, to, to also be aware that in most territories, uh, probably. I mean, this is generalizing, but half the, the half the value of a stream that's for publishers and writers is classed as a performance income and the other half is classed as a mechanical income even though there's no ah. oh really no okay physical thing but that's how it that's generally how it works so the value of one stream 80 percent of the value of one stream goes to the record company 20 percent of the value of one stream goes back to the songwriters and the publishers and of that part that goes back to the publishers and the writers usually half is classed as a mechanical the other half is classed huh. as a performance it's not the same in all territories so that's why it makes it more complicated than what it used to be back in the day but I'm, wow. it's a very general thing but that's good to know because i didn't even like i know all these organizations but i never think about what the breakdown is so it's very good so look latan has come back and said yes i think that makes sense but the funny thing is i've seen some collecting societies in africa that insist on assignment deals being signed, which I found very weird. Yeah, I wouldn't, I, well, I, without seeing them, I don't know if they're asking for an assignment of the copyright, which yeah. that's probably, you don't want them, you don't want the Performing <laughs> Rights Society to own your copyrights. They're, they're yeah. a collection body, not an ownership body. Yeah. And the nonprofit here, at least PRS is nonprofit. So yeah, just be careful. <laughs> of what what it is and if in doubt talk to a lawyer <laughs> so that, that's yeah. what i always say is you know before you sign anything make sure you have a good music industry lawyer look it over just to you know, when sure i worked in one band at at, uh, at creation they said that oh yeah my lawyer is my best friend or my only friend <laughs> so in certain cases it's pretty important so 
We've been on for ages. Does anybody ha else have any more questions? There was one question uh, I saw, but how do you take a songwriter from zero to hero? So I quickly- Oh quickly yeah, go for it. I saw that. <clears throat> right. So I had the good fortune to sign a young lady called Corinne Bailey Ray. Uh, she was working with a writer that I published. He sent me a song called Like a Star that she'd written 100%. I went, this is great. So she, no one was interested at the time to sign her to a publishing deal. So at being an independent publisher, I went, I will take a risk on this. So we signed a publishing deal. And it took me about three years before, from the time I signed her to the time she released her, her first album was literally three years. And in that time, I got her working with Mark Hill, Craig David's writer, uh, I did a whole bunch of different writers. And uh, she eventually wound up working with the two guys who wrote Put Your Records On. So it was a long process of finding people for her to write with to kind of get, to get the best songs from her. And we finally got there in, in the end. And also they, would, they produced part of the record as well. So, you know, it was a bit of a journey, but that's what it kind of takes to, you know, it, it came down to, as always, it comes down to having a great song, I think. I mean, I know, you know, it, you could get successful on TikTok or YouTube or whatever, but I think if you got a great song, you got half, you solved half the battle really. So. And, and I think like sort of the, fi the final comment, I, I want to talk about what we discussed la last time that, that, that this, because uh, I talk about this stuff all the time, like that it's not a straight line and you rhymed off a couple artists who got dropped and then became extremely successful. Well, yeah, Alicia Keys was one I could think of. Um, we said Alana Del, Lana Del Rey, I think Aretha was, Franklin. Aretha Franklin was one. Um, yes, yeah, there's, 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 you know, if you usually what I find is that, you know, if you scratch beneath the surface, the artists that have become successful, I don't know, The Weeknd might be a good example. You know, there's a there's a lot of work that's gone on behind the scenes and nobody's known about before they hit the big time and, you know, had a big hit single. So it usually... You know, I don't think there's any shortcut to six. I mean, there can be. I mean, you know, Lil Nas X, you know, has you know, off the back of TikTok and Old Town Road became massive, but he's a real true art. You know, he's, he can consistently write more hits. And I think that's also a key to, as an artist or a writer, longevity in the industry is being able to go, okay, well, it wasn't just a one off. I can do this again and again. And I think that's a, that's a real skill to be able to, you know, keep going. Max Martin is another good example of someone who's keeps reinventing himself and bringing new people into his world to, you know, that's keeping the music fresh and the songs relevant to, to what's on radio right now. Well, that's a good, good place to end. Basically work on the music and everything else should fall into place. You got a good song, you got half the battle done. I, I always come back to that. It's like, you know, you know, it's more likely it's going to get synced. It's more likely people are going to listen to it. It's, you know, all these things fall off the back of, you know, Katie Griggs and McLeod with Complex. You know, she's released songs before, which have done fairly well. She kept going, you know, songs are consistently good. Now she's written a real killer and people love it. And, you know, she's got a good fan base to, 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 to um, to le leverage onto bigger things off of that off of that one song, it's, it didn't just come out of nowhere. So, focus on your songs, keep going. All right, let's uh, let's stop there, Miller. Okay. If you want to throw any any details in the in the in the chat that you have, any contact details or you can pull yeah, vault, you, yeah. Uh, hang on, let's your see. LinkedIn or whatever whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll share my my. It's uh, I'll just type down my email address. Yes. but please beware i try to get back to everyone but i do get a lot of emails so uh if you do email me um don't you know don't be upset if i don't <laughs> please give me a minute um let's spell uh please give me a minute to um send chat to everyone right, right. well yeah thanks everyone okay. for coming yeah, yeah thanks great everybody. questions it was super cool. Um, uh, hope that's helped. I'm sorry I can't give you everybody kind of a cookbook recipe to how to be successful as a writer. There's many ways it happens, but um, 
you know, just keep keep going. And it, it, keep, yeah, it's the same keep, thing. It's theme every time I tell everybody. Look, the bad news is is that it's just not as straightforward as everybody wants it to be. Mm. And it's you know, um, but I what I like to do is I like to wave everyone off. So we'll see you all later. Come to the next event. I hope you signed up. Thanks for all the messages, uh, all the info. Thanks to you, Miller. It was brilliant. It was super fun to chat. Okay. Um, Stay safe, everyone. Take it see easy. See you later. See you Take later. Bye-bye, bye, everyone. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Waving everybody off. See you later, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye.